Hello, I'm Maureen, Museum Education Manager at Museum of the Earth, and I want to talk to you about the Barbara Page's Rock of Ages Sands of Time exhibit that we have here at the museum. If you get a chance, please come and see this exhibit. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's 544 tiles that represent a million years in the Earth's history, and it, fossils, and it follows fossils um, through that time. There are 3D fossils, and they, um, they represent the, the diversity and change of, of complex life through that time. So 544 million years is a long time, but life on Earth's been here a lot longer. And when you come into the museum, the first exhibit pretty much is this beautiful exhibit. And it has many, many different tiles, and it goes along as a story. And Barbara Page came several years ago and helped us to, to learn how to make the tiles as she did. She did such an absolutely beautiful job, but it turns out that it, they're really not difficult to make. And so we wanted to um, have an activity that helped you walk through how to make these amazing 3D tiles. Hello everyone, my name's Maria and I'll be your artist for today. You may be thinking, hmm, this doesn't look like those tiles, and you're right. We want to use a photo of a fossil on our tile, this photo of this fossil. And if we start off by doing a little preparation, it'll be a lot easier in the long run. I'm using a program called Meaty Bang Paint to put a grid on top of my photo. You can use many similar types of programs like GIMP or Photoshop, but I'm using this one since I use it a lot for myself. First, we want to crop out the part of the photo that we want to use. I'm using the canvas size function under edit to make the digital canvas the same size and shape as the physical one. Here is just making width and height equal since it's a square. If you're using the same program as me, make sure to desele deselect the delete area outside of canvas button. Next, I'm using the transform tool under select to move and resize the photo so it's just about where I want it to be on my final tile. Once you're satisfied with where it is, you have a couple options. You can print it out and use a technique I'm going to show you later to draw a grid on it, or you can go Google yourself up a picture of a grid. Pick one with a white background and copy and paste it on your photo. I'm using the transform tool again to resize the graph so it's the size of our real life canvas. The tile I'm eventually going to use is 6 by 6 so I want to make sure that this graph that I have has six blocks on both the side and the bottom. When I finally have it just where I want it, I'm going to go over to the layer panel here, to the blending drop down menu, and I'm going to select multiply. And ta-da! The white parts of the graph become transparent, and you can see your photo with the grid on top. Alright, now let's get into the hands-on stuff, starting with the support. Like Barbara Page, we're going to be using a hard masonite tile, brand name Hardboard. You can also use sturdy cardboard or a flat piece of wood. The trick here is this one's been prepared. We have two layers of something called gesso, one painted with horizontal strokes and one with vertical strokes. It's just to give us sort of a light monochrome surface to draw and paint on, so you can use the color of acrylic paint if you like. Now, this is where all the hoopla of getting that grid on our fossil picture comes in we're going to make a grid of the same size on our tile. So I'm just going to draw some little lines in inch apart across the top and then across the bottom of our tile. And I'm going to connect them so that the tile has stripes. I'm going to do the same thing on the other two sides and ta-da, a grid. All right, now that we have our grid, well, let's just get started sketching. You might be wondering, like, what is the point of drawing a grid on this if we're just going to draw over it? Well, gridding is a technique that can be used to copy artwork that's far easier and way more accurate than simply freehanding it, especially if you're not that confident as an artist. This whole time, I have a reference image just off screen on my computer, estimating where the lines of the fossil cross the lines of the grid and using it to figure out just about how big stuff is in comparison. Um, it's just sort of 
drawing loosely approximately in the same places. To be honest, I'm actually looking at my reference more than I'm looking at what my hands are doing. If you find drawing something like this intimidating, you could also try going box by box and zooming in and, and just focusing on one small part. But just remember to zoom out occasionally and make sure everything looks good together. Most importantly, remember this doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't even have to be good, we're just trying to get an idea of where we want our fossil to go so that we can sculpt and then paint on top of it. You can add or subtract or erase as many times as you want, um, just until you get your sketch to where you want it to be. A good foundation is really important for a good final project. And I'm just about done. I'm going to freehand in a few more Archimedes down at the bottom and fill out the composition just a little, and there! Now that we have our base together, let's get started on bringing it into the third dimension. I'm using a kind of clay called paper clay. It's made from cellulose fiber, the paper, so it's light and strong and really good for this sort of wall hanging piece. It's air dry too, so you don't have to bake it. A real boon when you're working with something that can catch on fire. I'm keeping mine wrapped in a damp paper towel just off screen so it doesn't dry out while I'm working. In fact, if you ever find your clay getting dry, stiff, or breaking when you're working with it, you can knead just a little bit of water into it until it becomes soft again. When I'm done, I'm going to wrap it back up in a paper towel and store it in a cool place. Now that the clay cares out of the way, let's actually get to the sculpting. I'm breaking out small pieces of the clay and rolling it into balls or tubes or even just lumps and sticking it onto my tile, sort of within the lines of my sketch. Then I'm sort of mushing it down and shaping it a little bit with my fingers. It might take a little bit of work to get it to stick to your tile, since the gesso can be a little bit slick, but stick with it, and it'll work. I also have a plastic tool here that's made for shaping clay, but really you can use anything that you have. Toothpicks, sticks, pencil erasers, basically anything you don't eat off of. Be creative and see what kinds of shapes and textures you can make with your tools. If you want to make your clay nice and smooth, you can dip your hands and your fingers into some water, just a little bit damp, and smooth out the surface. Not too much or it'll become kind of soupy and might even detach. You can see me going back and forth between the water and the canvas to do this. I'm probably realizing about now that I should have started from the top and starting from the bottom was a kind of a mistake. Since I wanted to make those nested cup shapes, I kept knocking the one below when I was trying to tack a new one on. Make a plan, kids. Don't be like me. But we soldier on, going from adding clay to removing clay to shaping and smoothing and adding detail and texture and comparing it all to my reference until I'm happy with the result. I'm not really going for a prominent sculpt here. Most of Barbara Page's tiles only have a little bit of sculpting on sort of the main focus area, and I, I really wanted to replicate that, but this is my choice. If you want to sculpt mountains, follow your bliss. I'm really adding most of the depth with the paint. Speaking of paint, looks like I'm just about done. I'm going to dry this overnight so it's completely hard um, and we can paint it. I almost can't wait. Maria here again to take you through our third and final step, painting. We have a couple colors of paint here from across the spectrum, um, and we're just going to squeeze tiny little amounts onto our palette plate. A lot of these I only use tiny little dabs of, so you should be sparing with your first uh, squeezes. Once we have all our paint set, let's kick this into high gear. All right, I'm going to start with the background. Originally, I was planning to go with a more realistic color that matched my photograph better, um, which I got from mixing one of my greens with some browns and black. Um, but I gave that up pretty quickly and just went for the pure green, since it meant I wouldn't have to keep mixing colors. I'm applying the color with a thick, round brush that's big enough to give me good coverage, but small enough that I can use it to blend. Once I have a good layer or two of the green and you can't really see the grid and the sketch beneath it, I decide it's time to get a little bit weird. I dab just the tips of my brush into a red, a blue, and a purple, just so that I have the tiniest little bit, and I dab it onto the wet green base layer. Then I sort of jitter my hand up and down really fast 
so the two colors blend together. I stop before they blend completely and you can't tell the difference and so that there's just a little bit of modeling effect on there. I do that going back and forth between the green and the red, blue, and purple until I like how it looks. Then it's time to move on to the fossil itself. I switch to a smaller brush since we're going to do some detail work. Since the background is kind of dark, I use a coat of pure white acrylic paint to paint over where I want the fossil to be, just like we did with the gesso. Then like I have every time, I start from the bottom and work up. To contrast the green background, I decide to go for a sort of warm tone to the fossil, so I mix a little bit of yellow with the white. That's going to be the base color for the fossil itself. Working one whirl at a time, I paint first with that light yellow. Then I want to add shadows to this piece, even the parts that are already 3D, since they're only slightly raised. Using my reference and the real lumps and bumps, I paint on red shadows in the dark areas and use a yellow tan mid-tone to sort of blend that dark red with the light yellow base. I work while the paint is wet so I can get a nice smooth mix between the colors. In the very darkest shadows, like the inside of the whorl, I paint purple. I don't use any black here. Adding black will make the color darker, yes, but it will also make the color duller and grayer. White has the same effect, but lighter. In fact, I use a tiny little bit of pure white on the highlights and it ends up looking a little bit blue in comparison to the warm yellows and reds. I want my colors to be bright, but it's really a matter of preference. You can stick with natural browns and grays if you like, or you can be mostly re realistic with little touches of color on the highlights, or you can go completely crazy and use blues and pinks and whatever makes you happy. When I'm satisfied with my paint job, and the highlights and shadows are where I want them, I paint a little line of purple on the right and a little line of red on the left. Eventually I decided I want the red to be blended out a little bit. This creates a shadow underneath the fossil and separates it from the background, making it sort of pop out, making the shadows and highlights look sort of brighter in comparison. The process is the same for each whirl. Light yellow base, Shade with tan, red, and purple while the paint is still wet, and then outline with the shadows. And of course, I always keep my reference right by my side. You might see me sort of jumping back to ones I've already done. That's because as I'm working, I'm coming up with new ideas and sort of seeing what works, and I'm going back to the ones I've already done so that I can make them look better. When I'm done painting my fossil, I decide that I really like it and I want to ditch parts of my original plan. So the original fossil had these sort of broken pieces of the bryozoan around the whorls. So I decide I don't want to put them on there because I spent way too much time shading. Instead, I decide I want to put them sort of around the fossil to just sort of fill out the composition a little bit. I use the same colors that I used on the Archimedes, the light tan, the red, the purple, and draw a grid. Once I'm done with my broken bryozoan pieces and I'm satisfied with my composition, I decide I'm done. So I sign my name in the corner. Thank you all for joining me on this journey. I hope that you like what I've made and I hope that I can inspire you to make something beautiful as well. Happy holidays.